Hello, my name is Derek Atkins, and this is recording is for the um, Theology 2 course at the East Asia School of Theology. This is part two of the video lecture on the origins of human life. If you have not yet watched part one of this video lecture, please go find part one and watch that and then come back to this to part two. So we we ended part one uh, talking about some of the problems with the evolutionary theory. And now we're going to begin part two <clears throat> by continuing this discussion of, of some of the problems that exist with evolution. So let's look at another problem that exists with the theory of evolution. One of the problems with evolution is that the dating methods that are used is less than reliable than suggested by scientists. Dating methods for determining the age of the earth are extremely unreliable and often use suspect means for measurement. Much of the dating techniques are circular and are based upon the already determined date of the fossil record strata. In addition, the amount under scrutiny for such dating techniques are very small. Only minuscule variations in amount can change the result by literally millions of years. Beyond all this, much radiometric dating illegitimately assumes several important things. First, it assumes that no end products were present at the start of the fossilization process. Second, it assumes a closed system of operation when the rocks used are by no means in a closed system. They are subject to such natural processes as leaching, erosion, and exposure. Third, many of the dating techniques are quite subjective and open to various interpretations. Fourth, many of the dating methods and techniques have been demonstrated to be patently faulty and erroneous, at least on definitively testable subjects. So let me summarize some of these problems by using a quote from Dwayne Gish. This is what he says. According to the Oxford Dictionary definition of science, for a theory to qualify as a scientific theory, it must be supported by events, processes, or properties which can be observed, and the theory must be useful in predicting the outcome of future natural phenomena or laboratory experiments. An additional limitation usually imposed is that the theory must be capable of falsification. That is, it must be possible to conceive of some experiment, the failure of which would disprove the theory. It is on the basis of such criteria that most evolutionists insist that creation be refused consideration as a possible explanation for origin. Creation has not been witnessed by human observers. It cannot be tested experimentally. And as a theory, it is non-falsifiable. The general theory of evolution also failed to meet all three of these criteria, however. It is obvious, for example, that no one has observed the origin of the universe the origin of life, the conversion of a fish into an amphibian, or an ape into a man. No one, as a matter of fact, has even observed the origin of a species by naturally occurring processes. Evolution has been postulated, but it has never been observed. 
So this is a big problem with evolution. Another problem with evolution is the problem of time and chance. Um, so earlier, we saw how um, evolutionists argue that the age of the universe gives us enough time for evolution to work. However, the time needed for evolution to go from a single cell organism to the variety of animals and plants we have today is longer than the age of the universe. So this is a big prop, another big problem with evolution. There's yet another problem with evolution, and that is the problem of organic life evolving from non-organic matter and energy without aid or direction. Um, this is another problem that we touched on earlier. According to Michael Behe in his book, Darwin's Black Box, the evolution of even the simplest life form is so fantastically improbable given the complex and integrated nature of the so-called absolute simplest organic life form that it defies reasonable explanation and begins looking more like an ideological commitment and less like a sensible argument. In addition, the stark and irreconcilable differences between so-called eukaryotic and prokaryotic forms of single-celled organisms suggest that evolution of life from non-life would have had to happen not just one, but twice. This is so patently unlikely, it borders on the ludicrous and ridiculous. In addition, most genetic mutations are harmful. Most, for example, genetic mutations can cause any number of diseases, such as cancer, cystic fibrosis, or Down syndrome. The likelihood that non-directed mutations would actually increase the chances of survival for a certain species is quite low. Because the problem is most genetic mutations are harmful. And if, and if the theory of evolution says that um, animals evolve, through the survival of the fittest and most genetic mutations are harmful, then that means the odds of survival for any single species is actually quite low. And there are more problems with evolution. One of these problems is the question, where did human life come from? Late, earlier, we asked, where did the universe come from? And we also asked, where did life come from? And now we're asking, where did human life come from? Because just like these earlier problems, this is a similar problem. Where did the first human come from? Some people, evolutionists would say, we came from Neanderthals, who came from Cro-Magnon, who came from earlier hominids. But what proof do we have that humans really did evolve from Neanderthals, Cro-Magnon, and earlier hominids? Another problem with evolution is that the best theories which account for all observed human behavior and thought strongly support the idea that we are more than complex machines. So earlier in the first part of this lecture, I talked about how one of the underlying 
assumption behind evolution is this idea that humans are nothing more than complex machines. But we have evidence, in fact, strong evidence, that we are indeed more than complex machines. Now, this debate will continue as the line between humans and machines become more and more blurred in the coming years. But it is important that we hold to the truth that humans are more than highly advanced biological machines. Okay. Because here's part of the reason why this debate is going to become more and more complicated. Um, a number of years ago, someone used an AI program, artificial intelligence program, um, actually an algorithm, used an algorithm to create um, some classical music, to actually compose classical music. Um, and so this computer program scanned all the classical music of different, of different composers in the past, such as Beethoven, Bach, uh, Tchaikovsky, and others. And then it analyzed those musical compositions. And then this algorithm, this computer program, created new musical compositions based on its analysis of the music of these past musical giants. Then the person who created this program played this music in front of live audiences. At first, he did not tell them who wrote these songs. And when he did not tell people who wrote these songs, they raved about how original this music was how inspiring it was, how beautiful it was. But a curious thing happened. Once he said, once he revealed or told the audience that the music they had heard had actually been written by a computer, the audience reaction flipped 180 degrees. Instead of... Um, praising the music, they asserted that there was no way this music had been written by a computer. Or if it was, it was not real music. But this gets to the point of, to the heart of the question I'm talking about. In the coming years, we're going to see the line between humans and machines increasingly blurred through examples like what I've just talked about. And so as this line between computers and humans becomes increasingly blurred, the question is going to come up, what makes us human? And so this is why we really need to come up with a good answer to this question. What makes us human? Why, what proof can we show that we are more than just complex machines? And honestly, the answer is going to have to be rooted in the biblical doctrine of being created in the image of God, the Imago Dei. Okay, here's, here's another problem with evolution. Humans are not necessarily the result of evolutionary processes going from easier to more complex form. In other words, is it true that evolution always leads to more complex life forms? Is it possible for evolution to lead to go to move from complex life forms to simpler life forms? After all, in the business world, many companies try to discover more efficient ways of doing business. 
And one of the ways they have of increasing efficiency is by simplifying things. So if companies, if human beings are able to simplify processes in companies and on factory lines, who's to say that evolution itself might not at times do the same thing? Simplify, take a complex process, make it more efficient by simplifying things. So this is another problem with evolution. Yet another problem with evolution is that humans and apes do not necessarily share a common ancestor. There are actually several competing theories about the evolution of humans. And given the different problems with the fossil record and with dating fossils, there is no certainty about how humans evolved from previous life forms. So as you as you talk with evolutionists or people who believe in evolution, one question you can ask them is, well, which of these hominid um, life forms did we actually evolve from? And you will find that if these people have done their homework, they can't answer that question because they will have different answers. So this is another problem with evolution. Along similar lines, one other, another problem with evolution is that human beings did not necessarily come into existence a long time ago. You know, we've been told that the first humans appeared three to four million years ago. But the Eve hypothesis, which examines micro mitochondrial DNA that can be passed down only through mothers, suggests that humanity is only 200,000 years old. Furthermore, scientists have discovered that the vast majority of human mutations occurred during the past 5,000 years. So if you go with the, even if you go with the Eve hypothesis and say that humans have been around for 200,000 years, that's a lot, that's a lot shorter than three to four million years, like some evolutionists claim. So this is another problem. And um, my own personal opinion is that as science discovers more and more about our amazing universe, science will increasingly come closer and closer to the biblical account of creation. Um, I could be wrong about that, but that is my personal opinion. And the E hypothesis is one of the bits of evidence that I would point to to confirm my opinion. Okay, so we've looked at some problems with um, evolution. Now, let's look at the theory of special creation also known as creationism. This theory is adhered to by such people and organizations as the Institute for Creation Research, Dwayne Gish, Henry Morris, John Whitcomb, Roger Oakland, Walter Bradley, and Gleason Archer. So creationists believe that human life is the result of the supernatural creative activity of God. So they believe that human beings are the result of the direct creative activity of God. Okay. They believe, and so there, there, there are some differences of opinion 
about whether God God created us directly by using means such as evolution or by simply um, form directly forming us from the dust of the earth, um, which would be a far more literal interpretation of Genesis 2. Creationists also believe, say that human beings were created in a short period of time. Creationists would argue, argue that human beings are the highest form of created life on earth. Now, the dip, now creationists have shared this belief in common with evolutionists because evolutionists also believe that humans are the highest form of life on earth. But the difference is that evolutionists believe that humans became the highest form of life on earth through evolution. Whereas creationists say that God created humans separate from all the other animals and he created us as the highest form of animals on earth or as, as the highest form of created life on earth for the purpose of taking care of the rest of creation. Now, there is, as I mentioned, there is disagreement among creationists about whether human beings were created either a geologically short time ago or a geologically long period of time ago. Thus, some like Gleason Archer and Walter Bradley think that the Earth was created a long time ago and that there are huge gaps in time that are not mentioned in the pages of Scripture. Others, like Henry Morris and Dwayne Gish, think that the Earth is perhaps closer to 20,000 years old. So let's look at some of the evidence for creation. Um, the first thing I want to say is that the evidence for evolution is not convincing. As I mentioned earlier, once I realized that there are serious problems with the theory of evolution, I then embraced the biblical creation account. In the same way, one strategy we can use when talking with people about creation is to show them why evolution has serious problems. And this is why I took so much time to detail the many problems that evolution has. Because once people hear about and understand these problems, they may become more open to accepting the biblical account of creation. Of course, I have to add, that only the Holy Spirit can lead people to accept the biblical account of creation, much less coming to faith in Christ. Okay. The next thing, the next bit of evidence we have for creation is that the Bible clearly teaches that God created human life. So I've listed a number of different verses from the Bible that attest to this fact, that attest to this reality. Um, I'm not going to quote every verse, but I will list them for you very quickly. Genesis 1, 27, Genesis 5, 1 and 2, as well as Genesis 6, 6 to 7. Deuteronomy 4, 32, Psalm 89, 47, Ecclesiastes 12, 1, Isaiah 27, 11, Isaiah 42, 5, Isaiah 43, 7, and Isaiah 40, 54, 16, Malachi 2, 10, Matthew 19, 4, Mark 10, 6, 1 Corinthians 11, 9, Colossians 3, 10, 1 Timothy 2.13, and 1 Peter 4.19. So if you want, you can write down these references 
and examine them for yourselves. And uh, these references can help you as you talk with believers and non-believers about creation. Okay, now we have some more evidence for creation that comes from the Bible because the Bible teaches that humans were complete at the moment of creation. Uh, for example, and we see this uh, not only in the description of how God created everything, but also in the pronouncement that God made at the end of each day of creation. Because at the end of each day of creation, God kept saying, it is good, it is good. In fact, in Genesis 1.31, after he created the first man and the first woman, he said, it is very good. And so we see in the Bible, in the Genesis account, that Adam and Eve were created as fully grown adults. Now, the Bible may allow for the creation of human beings to have occurred at a longer or shorter period of time ago. Um, as much as we wish, Genesis 1 and 2 simply don't tell us when God created the universe, when God created planet Earth, or when God created Adam and Eve. Was it 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, or millions or even billions of years ago. So we just don't know because the Bible does not tell us. But the Bible definitely affirms that God created everything, including the universe, planet Earth, and the first human. Now, here's another bit of evidence for creation. No other option for the origin of human beings has been presented as a reasonable alternative. And what I mean here is that while evolutionists have presented an alternative for the origin of human beings, we've seen, we've seen all the problems that there are with evolution. But there are no other alternatives for the origin of human beings. In other words, you have the option of, of evolution, you have the option of creation, but there are no other third, fourth, or fifth options for the origin of human beings. And therefore, and, and even if we limit the option to evolution and creation, um, the problems we've seen with evolution lead, leads us to the conclusion that there are no other option, alternatives to divine creation to explain the origin of the universe or the origin of life. Now, We've looked at some of the evidence for creation, but just like evolution, there are some problems with creationism. And um, as much as we don't want to admit this, honesty requires that we acknowledge that there are problems with creationism. So I'm going to go through some of these problems so that you will be aware of what these problems are. And I want to encourage you to, even now, to begin to think about how um, you can deal with these problems in creationism. So the first problem with creationism is that not all evidence in the natural world has been reconciled with the biblical account of creation. Okay. This includes the geological record, because there appears to be evidence that geological processes have, have indeed occurred over a very long period of time. 
Okay. So we have not yet been able to reconcile that with the biblical account. Yes, some people try to reconcile this by pointing to the flood and argued that a worldwide flood would have sped up some of these geological processes. That may be true, but we also have to be honest and say that the geology, the geology of the rocks that we do observe does seem to point to a very long period of development. Another problem, and this is something that I have long been aware of because of my love for astronomy, and that is astronomical observations suggest that there are problems with creationism. Because as I mentioned in the first um, part of this lecture, one of the reasons why evolutionists point, uh, one of the reasons why evolutionists say they believe that evolution is true is because of the age of the universe. You know, because when we look at the stars, some of the stars and even some of the galaxies that we see are millions and even billions of light years away. And like I said, a light year is the distance that it takes light to travel in one year. And light is traveling at 300,000 kilometers per second. So a light year is a very long distance. And then if you have a galaxy that is millions or even billions of light years away, that means it took that light millions and even billions of years to reach us. And so this is a problem with creationism because you have to find we have to find some way to account for that that will some way to explain how this is true while also saying that the biblical account of creation is also true. So, um, creationists have offered various explanations for these natural phenomena. Some of their explanations are not very convincing, while other explanations are more convincing, although many might not consider even these explanations to be fully convincing. Regardless of whether one believes in a young Earth creation or an old Earth creation, any creationist must account for the apparent discrepancy between the evidence found in general revelation with the evidence found in the Bible. Okay. So that's one major problem with creationism. Another major problem with creationism is the same problem as evolution. The evidence for special creation cannot be validated in a laboratory. And we saw how this is a problem with evolution. Evolution cannot be validated in a laboratory. So just as evolution cannot be validated in a laboratory, so the same is true of creationism. Creation cannot be validated in a laboratory. So if we are honest, we must be willing to admit that no human has actually observed creation. And we cannot prove creation by any scientific experiment since creation was a one-time event. So we cannot replicate creation. Okay. Okay, here's another problem with creation. Sometimes it is difficult to correctly understand the teachings of scripture in passages that are not clear on certain issues related to this topic. And so when this happens, we should humbly acknowledge 
our limited understanding and affirm those truths that the Bible does make clear. And here, I'd like to leave you with a helpful um, quote from Mark Twain. Now, Mark Twain was um, a famous atheist from the um, 19th century. But Mark Twain once said something very wise. He said, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that I have problems with. Rather, it's the part of the Bible I do understand. Okay, so what he's saying is, Mark Twain did not understand, there were many things Mark Twain did not understand about the Bible, but he said those parts didn't, didn't weren't um, the problem. The parts he had trouble with were the parts of the Bible he did understand. Okay, so what can we say at this point? Well, one of the things we can say is that the Bible clearly teaches that special creation is the correct theory for the origin of human life. We can also say that traditional teachings of the church affirm and reconfirm that creation is a direct activity of God without intermediary steps in the development of the first human being. So these are a couple of statements that we can affirm. Now, there are some acceptable areas of disagreement and speculation even among believers when it comes to talking about the how and when of creation. For example, the length of the day upon which humans were created. Was it, were these, were the six days that we read about in Genesis chapter one and Genesis two, literal 24 hour days, or were they thousands of years long or even millions or billions of years long? Um, the Hebrew word yom is used, what is used um, to, des to describe, okay, so let me back up. In Genesis 1 and 2, the English word for day is actually a translation of the Hebrew word yom. And the Hebrew word yom is used throughout the Genesis account of creation. Normally, the word yom refers to a 24-hour day. But there are scholars who argue that yom in Genesis 1 and 2 might not refer to a literal to literal 24-hour days and that they should instead be understood in a more expansive manner. So there is a broad range of different beliefs among Christians about how long creation took place from those who argue for billions of years and that evolution was the method God used to create everything to young earth creationists who argued that God created everything 6,000 years ago in six literal 24-hour periods. Now, even though there is room for disagreement among Christians or for debate, um, there are heretical teachings that we need to avoid and even condemn. Um, and these heretical teachings, and these heretical teachings are any um, teachings that affirm naturalistic evolution or any theory that denies the direct creation of the first human being by God, okay? So these are heretical teachings that we need to avoid and even condemn. 
For example, in recent years, a new debate has started over whether Adam and Eve were historical persons or whether they are to be understood only in mythological terms. And so um, to understand Adam and Eve as anything other than historical persons would be a heretical teaching. So this is something we need to avoid. Now, um, we're going in class, we are going to discuss um, what we've talked about in this video lecture. So to open our classroom discussion, let me read a quote from Philip Johnson concerning tactics in evolutionary theory versus the Christian perspective on the origins of human life. Here's what he says. Given that Darwinian evolution is so continually employed to support naturalism and thus to discredit theistic religion, how should Christian theists respond? For those who regard scripture as more authoritative than scientific theories and who are confident that they know the correct way to interpret scripture, the answer may seem clear. Defend the literal Genesis account and employ scientific argument to discredit the alternative. This creation science strategy has been remarkably successful at maintaining an anti-evolutionist constituency as Gallup poll results attest. Unfortunately, it has also confused and divided the Christian world and even played into the hands of the evolutionary naturalist. It gives the impression that the important division in public opinion about evolution is between the biblical fundamentalists and everybody else. This is a tragic misunderstanding. The truly fundamental disagreement is not over the age of the earth or the method of creation. It is over whether we owe our existence to a purposeful creator or a blind materialistic process. In terms of the 1991 Gallup poll, 47% and the 40% are fundament fundamentally in agreement in comparison to the 9%. When the overwhelming majority finally realizes this, the dominance of evolutionary naturalism in our media and educational system will come to an end. The perception that a doctrinaire young universe, seven day fiat creationism is the only real alternative to a doctrinaire evolutionary naturalism is continually exploited by the Darwinists. When they are hard pressed on the logical and evidentiary problems of their own position, they change the subject and go on the offensive on the dating question or ridicule the, hit, the story of Noah's flood. As a result, they are largely successful in concealing the defect in Darwinism and holding educated, open-minded people in their own camp. What is needed at this point to bring out the truth is a strategy that puts aside the questions about biblical authority and interpretation and focuses on the most important scientific and philosophical questions. In particular, what is the evidence that mindless material processes like random mutation and differential reproduction can do the necessary work of creation. Consider also the words of John C. Lennox. Most of us would surely agree that it is important to distinguish between matters that belong to the core message of the Bible and issues that are less central where there is room for variation in opinion. We also need to be prepared to distinguish between what scripture actually says 
and what we think it means. It is scripture that has the final authority, not our understanding of it. It, it is a sad spectacle and one that brings discredit on the Christian message when those who profess to believe that message belie their profession by fighting among themselves or caricaturing others rather than engaging in respectful discussion through which all sides might just learn something. So what these two gentlemen are saying is we should not hinder the gospel or get sidetracked on non-essential issues. It is most often, and in fact, it is a it is often a waste of time and energy. Okay. If there is genuine interest, then by all means pursue this discussion. Lewis Winkler once had a friend who is a biology major who came to know Christ through a series of discussions that he had, that they had on the topic of creation and evolution. Okay. But be sure that the person whom you're talking with is genuinely open to talking about the issue and is not simply looking to engage you in a dead-end argument. So what I'm saying here is the question of creation is hugely important, but some people can become so involved in this debate between evolution and creation that we never get around to talking about the gospel itself. The good news that Jesus Christ came to the earth, died for our sin, so that we could have eternal life through faith in him. So if a person is genuinely open to talking about evolution and the problems with evolution and the reasons why we can believe in creation, then yes, talk about it. But if you find that this debate is a dead end and prevents you from talking about the gospel, then you might want to consider some way to end the debate of, talk, of talking about creation versus evolution and move the conversation to talking about the gospel. Now, when you just when you do discuss evolution and creation with someone, it's important to emphasize that the most important point in the discussion, namely that God created human beings, although we do not necessarily know exactly how he did so, okay? So again, the main point is not whether God created the world in six days or six billion years, or whether, uh, or how God created us, whether he created human beings by using evolution, or whether he created us um, by direct divine means. The main question is, did God create us? Or are we here because of blind, non-directed chance? That's the real issue. That's the real question. For more information, you can check out Lewis Winkler's very brief article entitled The Evolution Versus Creation Debate, and you can consider the book edited by J.P. Moreland entitled The Creation Hypothesis. And finally, we should, you should try to keep the conversation focused on Christ because he is the most important person in all of history, indeed in all of the universe. So 
I hope that this video has been helpful for you in understanding, better understanding some of the many problems that evolution has and some of the reasons why we can believe the biblical account of creation. And so in class, we are going to discuss this issue further. So please come to class ready to discuss this and to discuss the implications of this video lecture. So I look forward to seeing you in class.